Arlington was the birthplace of Uncle Sam, the location of the first public children's library, and the site of most of the fighting when the British marched through it, returning from the Old North Bridge at the start of the Revolutionary War. Welcome, Gary, and thank you for speaking with us today. This is not your first appearance with us. However, today we would like to create a holistic view of your professional career as a resident of a historic American town, a university professor and author. Thank you, John. Good to be with you. Good. It's good <laughs> to have you back. To begin, Gary, has living in Arlington, a place steeped in tradition and history, influenced your work? Yes. Um, all but one of my novels takes place in the greater Boston area, uh, the first novel taking place in the Mediterranean. Um, and so I needed to have a locale for my characters, and because I know Boston well, and I know Arlington well, having been here a long time, I decided to make my characters at home in Arlington. For a few of the books, I, um, I, ca I caught the Carlton just to protect the innocent, uh, but then I went back and they've been Arlington for the last six or seven books. Um, in many ways, not only is Arlington very special in terms of its location to Boston, but it's, it's cultural, it's a cultural center. Um, it has a nice diversified um, populace. It is close to all the major highways. It's close to all the schools in town. Uh, and it's a great location, not only to live, but to uh, generate a novel from. Um, and I spent many, many years in the Arlington Library, um, in the Robbins Library, in that glorious room in front, uh, reading room, where I brought my laptop and wrote several scenes from several of the novels. So Arlington has been good to me. I've been very uh, appreciative of living here. Several of the novels have, uh, have scenes in some of the eateries in town. Scooter is one of our favorites, the late great Florida, Flora, um, Not Your Average Joes. Um, there are scenes in Arlington Center in some of the books. So, I mean, it, it, Arlington is dear to me and it's dear to the, the books I've written. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it certainly has its place. In it your, has its in place, yes. That's, right. that's yeah. great. Under your pen name, Gary Braver, you've been the best selling author of many books, including your first book, Atlantis Fire. Where did you get the idea for that book, Atlantis Fire? Okay, good. Um, Atlantis Fire is an archaeological thriller. Um, I had gone to Mallorca, Spain, which is a couple hundred miles off the coast of Spain, and was on a diving expedition uh, with an organization called Earthwatch, locally lo located. I think it was in Belmont originally, it's now in Boston. And I had read for a few hundred dollars I can go to Mallorca, Spain and dive on second century, dive for second century BC Roman and Phoenician wrecks. And I'd gone there and after the first week or so we found a wreck about a mile and a half offshore in very shallow water, 30 feet of water. So you could stay down there as long as you want, as long as you had air in your tank. And we were fanning away the sand and we came up with uh, shards of amphoras, uh, ancient ancient Coke bottles they used to move on the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the decks of ships with full of oil or almonds or, or seeds. And I noticed that a speedboat had cut across our bubbles overhead. And we had our rubber Zodiac boat anchored, cut across our bubbles, and then he came back and turned around and cut across the bubbles again. Uh, once it's an accident, two, it's kind of dumb, three, it's on purpose, four, by tenth time, this was dangerous. So we flattened out on the water. My diaphragm is going like this because I'm out of a, almost out of air. My buddy was out of air too, so we flattened out. There was no cavities, no rocks to get behind, and nothing to get under. And this guy came at us with a speedboat and two pendant, two pendant anchors coming at us like robot claws. And I said, if I get out of this alive, I've got a book in it. <laughs> so I just moved all that experience because what we were did not know is we were, we were excavating wrecks and on the edge of a black market operation we didn't know about. The, the guy who came after us in the boat was a local godfather who had a very hot business in antiquities that he was pulling up from the bottom of the ocean and selling them to collectors and museums all over the world. So this was dangerous stuff, but I said, if I get out of here alive, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, get a book out of it. I had spent some summers in Santorini, Greece, which is the locale of 
Plato's Atlantis myth, and I just moved it all to the Mediterranean, that part of the Mediterranean, the, the Aegean Sea, and called Atlantis Fire, and the, and the divers are pulling up artifacts from Minoan civilization, 15th century BC, and that's where Atlantis Fire came from. But it was really from an experience. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. A very, very a trying but a terrific experience. experience too. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. Well, then you have four medical thrillers about breakthroughs of various improvements of the human biological condition. Mm -hmm. Mortality in Alexa, mm -hmm. human intelligence in gray matter, mm -hmm. dementia in flashback, and the scientific experiment to determine if there's an afterlife, mm -hmm. tunnel vision. Right, right. Tell us about those books. Okay, when you, uh, when you finish a book, it's like getting fired. Uh, I had written a book before that called um, Rough Beast, which is uh, placed in the Arlington Woburn area, and that was based on um, uh, W.R. Grace Company depositing a lot of toxic chemicals into the Woburn waters, and that became a very famous, um, famous court case that became um, a, a movie, in fact, with John Travolta, a civil action. Um, at, at that time, when I sold that book, the publisher said, give us more of these high concept novels Something that would be either a fantasy or, or fear of a large readership, uh, has a strong female character, centered around a family, and something that really is a good page turner. So I said, okay, what would be the greatest fantasy of human life? And that would be living indefinitely. I had spent some time in Papua New Guinea, which is as, it's a rainforest, the second largest island on the planet. And there are at least 400 different languages because it's absolutely impossible rainforest that is as thick as fur. And uh, while I was in New Guinea, there were representatives from Eli Lilly and other pharmaceutical companies that were going to remote villages and asking shaman which, which plants heal, which plants kill. They were looking for miracle drug, drugs growing on trees. Um, and that's been going on forever. The, the tribal people in New Guinea knew for 5,000 years that if they ate or made a tea out of the bark of the Quintona tree, that they would prevent it from getting malaria. So, I mean, there are a lot of pharmaceuticals that are from jungles. And I, I thought, what if there were in a very, very remote area of New Guinea a, an orchid that the business compound of which could prolong life? And that, um, I came up with elixir, which means, you know, a, a, a fountain of youth drug. And um, I had the scientist living in Arlington. I think I called it Carlton at that time. And he is, he um, synthesizes a business compound in this orchid, gives it to his animals, and lo and behold, the shaman told him, who claims he's 140 years old, um, that this would prolong life. And lo and behold, the, the test animals, his primates in his lab are living very long, well beyond their, uh, uh, their allotted time. Um, and of course, uh, something like, if you're going to have a compound that is, in, in, in fiction, a compound or anything that is going to cheat nature, there's gonna be a downside. If you get off your elixir shots, you would fast forward age and die. So that is the, that's a tension within the book. Um, and it, it becomes the hottest drug on the planet. Uh, this guy injects it in himself, of course, because he wants to live indefinitely. And, and it's, the old, um, it's the old Frankenstein caveat. In fact, all of the next several books are caveats. Watch out what you, what you wish for. And Elixir, you know, it's a, it's a fantasy I have. I wish I had a gallon of this stuff myself. But the, <laughs> uh, the, the, tampering, the warning about tampering with the natural order um, is dramatized in the book. Not only would it be a population nightmare, but it would be the elixirs and the elixir knots, those countries that have the elixir versus those countries that don't. Uh, it could be almost a kind of genetic apartheid. Um, also, if you have a six-year-old child and you inject the child with elixir, that kid will be six years old indefinitely. And, and that could be parental hell, yeah. <laughs> not to mention what yeah. it would do to a child. Um, and so all of these aberrations, if you take it and you stay at 35 years old and everyone in your family gets older than you, those are aberrations. Your son could biologically be older than you and your mate would be, you know, 
would age and die and you'd be, a, uh, so it, there are all sorts of um, issues there. Um, that did well, and the publisher said, give us more of the same. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was thinking, I need now another kind of MacGuffin, the Alfred Hitchcock term for something that gets everyone scrambling. Um, and I remember watching, um, Oh, I, I remember back in the 80s and early 90s that there were reports that parents can turn their kids into geniuses. Um, and there are all sorts of products that came out, baby Einstein, baby Shakespeare, baby Bach. And if you, if you play these games or play the music to these kids as they're very, very young, they'll grow up to be geniuses. In fact, there was something put up by Sony a device that, that attached to a pregnant woman's belly that would play classical music to her, her fetus. You know, I climbing mean the fetal charts today is, you know, Beethoven's fifth. So the, the, it was absurd. Um, but there had been a study in the 70s out of Harvard that said you can make your kids smarter than they ordinarily be if you expose them to intellectual and, and cultural things like music and art. Um, so that was gray matter, and it, it centered on a woman who adores her kid, but he's slow, and she lives in an upscale community where the rewards for intelligence are very obvious, all the fancy cars and fancy homes, and the kids go to fancy schools, and she's got a kid who's not going to live, uh, you know, live up to those, uh, th that kind of competition. And uh, she is tempted to have a very clandestine, a very expensive, and a very dangerous medical procedure that enhances the IQ of a slow child, and then everything goes awry from there. And, and that did fine, and then um, the, uh, uh, the next book was Flashback. Um, where'd that come from? Um, my aunt, who was a very bright woman who would, who, whose presence would fill a room, got dementia, and she was slowly bumping down the staircase um, to the end. And she was at a uh, nursing home nearby in, in Watertown. And uh, by that time, she was just something attached to wires and in a bed. And I'd gone there with my, my aunt, my, my cousin rather, who, her daughter. And my aunt was just sitting there kind of babbling and, and, and Alice and I were talking. And all of a sudden, something very, very, very Stephen King moment happened. She began my aunt in bed, who is not even verbal anymore, started speaking in a little girl voice in Armenian to her mother who had died 80 years before that. And it was one of those, oh my God, moments. And it occurred to me, what if someone were to develop a chemical that not only retards the development of the amyloid plaque that this destroys the brain and leads to Alzheimer's, which is Alzheimer's disease, but what, it, if it could reverse that process, not only stop it, reverse that process, um, and restore memory. And that gave me the idea um, for flashback. Um, at the time, I needed, and this is a, a, a question I always have to confront, what's the first thing I want to know about writing this book before I start writing it? Can I, can I convince the readers of the science? Um, and so I went online <laughs> and I, um, I googled cures for dementia. I got four million hits, if not more. But right at the top, right at the top, there was a paper that was about to be delivered in Zurich, Switzerland the next month by a team of elite neurosurgeons. And it was on curing or doing something about Alzheimer's. And they had found a neurotoxin that exists in Gila monsters, those orange and black beaded looking reptiles that live in Arizona and, and down into Mexico. The saliva of the Gila monster apparently is a neurotoxin that is poisonous. But if you, to, if you were to diminish the potency of that chemical and dilute it, it was used to retard dementia and even reverse some of the Alzheimer's horrors. And I said, okay, I'm Boston based. I live in Arlington. My family's gonna probably live in Arlington. Where am I gonna find a Gila monster <laughs> walking around? But, and take me back to Cape Cod when I was there bringing our children up, 
my wife Kathy. Off of Craigsville Beach, there is a float, a raft. And all the kids would pile on top of the raft and play chicken and tip it up this way, try to knock somebody off. One day, someone yelled, jellyfish! And they all bunched up in the middle. I said, jellyfish. And I said, neurotoxin. These little buggers really stink and they could do a number. And I had been diving in, in the barrier reef um, in Australia. And there is a, there is a, a, a jellyfish, Arakunji jellyfish, whose toxin is brutal. You'll, you touch it and you're dead. And there's absolutely no antidote for it. And we have a warm stream going up the Massachusetts coast. What if it got caught into a, a freakishly warm Gulf Stream and these ended up on Cape Cod? And that is where uh, the idea for flashbacks and, and somebody gets in the water and also a pharmaceutical company. And this is 10 years before Prevagen, the stuff that's on the market now, not approved by the FDA. You see it on every night in the commercials, you know, improve, yeah. your, improve your memory. This way before them, but I ha and they show jellyfish in their ads. I thought of that 10 years before, in any case. Um, and, and of course the issue is, again, the caveat, watch out what you wish for. This stuff works well, however, some people get thrown into flashbacks and relive on a, almost like a Mobius strip, the same scene over and over again. So if your father committed suicide by hanging himself, you're gonna relive that, over, you could relive that over and over again, so yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. there are always these repeats yes. to, um, do, you, do you doubt that, that they are not researching these very things today? Oh, they are researching I these mean, things. Oh, I mean, that would be a $50 billion pill. Yeah. If you can yeah. get something that's going to reverse, yeah, we are an older generation, mm -hmm. you know, so, we're, um, yeah. And, um, and then um, that was done, it did fine. But again, I like, fired again, I got to come up with a, a new novel idea. I was at a cocktail party and you gabbing as people gab at cocktail parties. And a woman came up and said, I understand you, see, you teach science fiction, you teach horror fiction. And then she said, I've had near-death experiences. And I said, okay, I said, tell me about your near-death experiences. She said she was um, in delivery for her fourth child and she thinks she died on the table, operating table. And she thinks she ended up by a well where a, a male figure looked like Jesus was standing next to her. And, and she's Jewish, so she's not brought up with Catholicism yeah. or, or Christianity. But he was the iconic image of Jesus. And Jesus said to her, um, she wanted to die. You cannot die, you still have other children. You just lost your baby of other children back home. Look down the well and you can see the other children. And like a magician's finger, she said, I woke up and I was uh, post delivery. I guess she lost her, her, her child or stillborn. Um, and she said, I, I just knew it was so much more real than a dream. I believed that I had had an out of the body experience and a near death experience and I saw this figure of Jesus. So that absolutely fascinated me. Near-death experiences go back to Plato, where soldiers died and they think they meet their, 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 their battle mates in the, in the afterlife. So that gave me the idea, what if there were a local neuroscientist who wants to take into her lab or prove that there might be, or demonstrate there might be an afterlife? And uh, that was, you know, that was an idea that I, you know, it, it, came out of also a lot of readings. I mean, in the 70s, there were stories that became, uh, uh, non, non, not stories, non-fiction books by scientists, apparently, that became national bestsellers. And even the term near-death experience was coined in the 70s, even though the, the concept goes back to Plato. Um, and then there were several books that made the bestsellers list of people, I, I saw God, and these, these kinds of, of um, religious uh, uh, nonfiction books. So I decided to write this book. And of course, the, the tunnel vision is also, again, as a, as a thriller, there is that sense of dread and that sense that um, watch out what you wish for. Um, and it, it works out very well, but the, the first thing I had to do was go to a neuroscientist before I started even typing, can this be done? Can we measure the mind of living the brain, he said, yeah, you could flatline a person and wake him up in three minutes. 
uh, and, and wire them up to a functioning MRI machine and see if the, br the mind leaves the brain. I said, great, and he gave me all these kind of technical stuff, and, and uh, I said, so I laced that in, and um, you can see the trend. The older I get, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. and you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't believe in an afterlife, but the older I get, the more I, I, I hope there is one. Um, so that was, that was tunnel yeah. vision, and that did very nicely, too. Yeah. Yeah. And a thousand yeah. years from now, that debate will still be going on. Oh, yeah, so, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So but it was, it, it, it was a nice way to, to merge science and, and religion without taking a side on either one, yeah. even though it was a kind of a yeah. kick at the end. Yeah. 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 Now, uh, one of the courses you taught at Northeastern uh, was science fiction. Yes. What, what drew you to that genre in oh, particular? Um, I read science fiction by the pound as a kid. I went to Worcester Tech uh, and majored in physics. And um, so I was very science-minded. And it was uh, in the 70s when the then chair of the English department um, said that the number of people taking electives in the Northeastern's English department was dropping, come up with what he called jazzy new courses um, that would draw more people. And because I read a lot um, of science fiction, I proposed uh, a course in science fiction. It was really one of the first around the college level. I mean, um, I had nothing to draw from. I had no one I could write to and say, send me your syllabus. You know. So um, I put together what I thought were um, literarily, re academically respectable books and, and some of my favorites. And um, it took off. But I started with the caveat that I've used all throughout all my writing and, and so many other writers have, and that is Victor Frankenstein, the Frankenstein novel by Mary Shelley. He makes something trying to improve on nature, built a, an eight-foot human being put together by scraps and hoping to kill death. Um, and, uh, and so that was what, you know, uh, I was doing in, in tunnel vision. And there is a warning, you know, watch out what you wish for, but I won't give anything away, yeah. Well, as yeah, you might yeah. remember. But science fiction, really, uh, science fiction has yeah. that in all these books, that same yeah. kind of thing. And it was fun to teach, and it took off, yeah, yeah. I grok that. Yes, you <laughs> grok remember that, that you know? <laughs> Robert yeah. Heinlein, yeah, yeah. <laughs> strange in a strange well, land. What yeah. do you find most rewarding about science fiction? That it does keep, a, the writers keep a finger on the pulse of technology and say, you know, watch out that technology science doesn't, um, doesn't mess up our dreams of the future. I mean, it's, it's future oriented. I mean, it is a genre that warns um, at, at, at that has long before the, the ecological crisis we're in now, climate change, people were writing about back in the early 20th century. Um, it says that there's wonders of science and wonders in technology. Uh, it, is the, it is what the imaginings of, imagination of writers gave us the concept of, of aliens in other worlds. I mean, War of the Worlds is the very first real yeah. science fiction alien invasion stuff. So it's, it's always these wonderfully imaginative kinds of stories coming out of these writers. Um, and it always, um, it will always be popular. Um, popular because of the imaginings and popular because of the warnings and popular because of the possibilities of, of human future. Yeah. Uh, is modern science fiction um, very different from the Heinlein days, Isaac Asimov days? Uh, yeah. what, what is the emphasis of modern science fiction? I think the emphasis and, uh, that it really comes from the publishers give us series. Series because they're looking about marketing and selling. So what many writers today are doing, and have done the last maybe 15, 20 years, um, take a federation, uh, intergalactic or interplanetary federation, and in a sense these old paradigms of us, us versus them, aliens versus humans, or aliens versus robots, or artificial intelligent creatures, or pe creatures with artificial intelligence. Um, and so you're always, you, you're in these kind of, the Romans and the ancient Rome, ancient Greek, but set into the stars. And, you know, Star Wars is essentially that old paradigm of our empire versus your empire. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah that, I remember from my, my early science fiction days, mm -hmm. A lot of the books I read that started my love for reading yeah. was about us going to other planets yes. and yeah. inhabiting them and living in them. Just simple stories. Yes, yeah. Is science fiction today story oriented or, or is it more, is it changed in that regard too? Because going yeah. to other planets 
it might not be as uh, as exciting. Right, as right, right. You want to keep the excitement level up. You want to keep the interesting science and the imaginings of other worlds and other creatures. But it's really character, I would say, the kinds of stuff being written out is character based. There's more emphasis on the personalities of the of the protagonists and the antagonists, um, just like Star Wars. I mean, you think about yeah. that. I mean, it, it's really um, you know Skywalker and, and, and you know uh, Darth Vader and the others. So who are these creatures? Who are these people? Um, the other stuff is ancillary. It's like it's like st a stage dressing. Your know, rockets and aliens and this and that, uh, getting you from here to there. But it really is about characters and and good science fiction writers who can create credible characters is is the way to go and yeah, th those no are the ones the best sellers can, sure. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah well what do you what do you hope your readers will take away from your books that they got hours of good reading pleasure that they it was a good tale well written uh, and that uh, it made them think yeah and they want to come back and buy a lot more books from Gary Braver <laughs> And, and what about advice for aspiring young authors? Okay. I'm sure teaching it, there were a lot of those in your classes. Right. Um, what, what is your advice to them? My advice is to read the authors you want to emulate. But don't speed read. Read them slowly. Study them. Look at another person's book the way a carpenter looks at a house, the angles, how they get in and out of scenes, how a strip of dialogue is not the way we talk, but the way dialogue happens in movies and in books where you can have characters distinguish from each other even though it's only five or six inches of narrative of, of dialogue um, but read and um, and like I said read slowly I remember years ago at Northeastern there were signs for speed reading courses where you you're taught to read a strip yeah, of words on the yeah. middle of the page I tore all those signs yeah, down <laughs> this is yeah. crazy professor tearing, tearing yeah. down the posters <laughs> but yeah really I mean, that is my advice and and write write every day I was telling Karen here earlier write every day to take notes even if you're not with, with, with a, got a three by five card or you have one of your devices um, pick up what people say, how they look, with how they dress, um, and take take a journal. That helps. Yeah. Do you, yeah. do you know of any of the students along the way who have become uh, published authors from your classes? Yeah, a few of them. Um, a few students from the science fiction course back in the '90s. So one uh, one or two students have written um, novels and had published some short stories in, in Oz, Asimov's. Uh, uh, magazine of the science fiction. Yeah, yeah, there have been, yeah. Do you think students came into these classes mostly hoping to do that someday, or...? I think so. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I had a reputation of being an easy grader, too. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the, the genres are attractive. I mean, science fiction, horror fiction, I mean, they're attractive. And maybe some of them, and in fact, some of them did say, I'd like to grow up to be a, a writer of, of this particular genre. Sure, yeah, yeah. Okay. they did. Yeah. Now, from, from your, um, your medically-oriented books, you mm -hmm. kind of departed right. uh, when you collaborated with Tess Gerritsen for right, the book right. Choose Me. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I got a copy. Look at this. Yes. I happen to have a copy right yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, and even Choose Me in Chinese. Right, so, yes. Yeah. Which, is, which is great. Um, and um, that was the Me Too movement, the emphasis on the right, Me Too right. movement. Now, your new book due out next week. I do want to say something about oh, this. Oh, yeah, sure, good. Um, how did Choose Me come about? I have known Tess Gerritsen for 25 years. We were on a panel together back in, in, uh, back in mid-'90s in Concord at a book festival. And uh, I had read a few of her books, and I was teaching a modern bestsellers course, and I said, would you be interested in coming in as a guest author? And she said, sure. So we set it up, and she came in four times over the years. Uh, they became good friends. And about five years ago at a Christmas party, uh, we were chatting away, uh, and she said, do you want to write a book together? Uh, give me a nanosecond. This is a <laughs> yeah. number one best-selling international author. I, I think we can pull this off, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was right at the height of the Me Team movement, as you mentioned, and uh, all sorts of celebrity males are being put away or being hauled in, like uh, Harvey Weinstein and um, uh, uh, Matt Lauer and others. Yeah. And she said, what do you think? I said, yes. I said, but I would, 
instead of having a medical setting as is, she had done in several books, how about a university setting? Because I can handle that better. And we decided that there's two sides to any kind of relationship, two sides to an illicit affair, the male and female. I would do the male chapters and she would do the female chapters. So I did all the male point of view chapters. I came up with the storyline and she liked that. And she did the female point of view chapters. And we did over the next 18 months, sent chapters to each other over email. We met only once, wow. talked on the phone twice, yeah. but everything was done by email. And because she had, she knew my books, I knew her books, we kind of spoke the same language. What I did learn from this, and it was, it was really exciting, a lot of fun, how she, we learned about her audience, because that was gonna be the, she's brand name, and her audience was female and over 50. 80% were female over 50. Oh. So I had to temper some of the male point of view chapters, not to be offensive, not to you know, make it too guy-ish. And, and so it was really interesting going back and forth. And she came back to me and said, do men really think this way? And I said, yes. And she checked with her husband, Jacob. Yeah, men, men think this way. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun writing the book. And it, it took off and got a lot of translations. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously. This is yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. It was, yeah. Although I, I'm unable to read the yeah, Chinese this, this version. Yeah, this is Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> The, interesting, the only two things that are in, in uh, Roman script are her name and my name, and they're almost the same size. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's quite an honor to yeah. have all of those. It was, it was a kick, Well, yeah. now your new book, Rumor of Evil. Okay, yeah. That's coming out October 10th. October uh, 10th, yeah. Speaking, yeah. and that's the second one in your departure from medical thrills. Correct, so. correct. I had had some police and some... Um, uh, police for uh, yeah, I had had police procedures and touches in a few back novels like Grey Matter, um, but since the um, the success of Choose Me uh, with Tess, um, my agent said, "Why don't you write your own series?" I said, "Oh yeah." yeah. So I came up with uh, two detectives. Um, they are from Cambridge, uh, for reasons that I won't get into. They're from Cambridge, and even though there are scenes in Arlington, and um, it is a, uh, there's a cold case and there's a current case. Um, the current case is that the two police detectives, homicide detectives, are investigating what appears to be a suicide um, in Cambridge. And uh, the character, the cops smell a rat. This is not, this is staged. This is not suicide. And it comes out, turns out to be a murder, a homicide. And as they investigate this particular homicide, they beget, begin to realize there's a cold case from almost 20 years ago behind this thing. Somebody is covering it with something that happened in Cambridge, or in Lexington actually, 20, nearly 20 years ago. That so an actual case. And, uh, and, uh, this this yeah. made up, but to an actual case back then where a exchange student from Slovakia who has Romany blood, gypsy, uh, is here and she is, uh, she's killed and the, um, uh, the, the cops think it was a cover up that, that is rumor of evil. The rumor had to do with the fact that she, uh, the kids who she hangs around with in school um, see her at a pizza party reading palms and she, they think she is a witch. There's nothing supernatural in the book but it's a rumor yeah. of evil. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it's exciting it to is. be looking well, forward yeah. to that. Yeah. Now, you, you already have sent in the second book in this series. I, I don't know if you can tell us no. anything about that um, title, anything uh, where it's not even okay, yeah, copy it's, it's yet. Okay, it's just done, um, and uh, the working title, and maybe the final title, is uh, Heat of the Moment. Um, it involves a, uh, the, the killing of a college professor uh, in, the, uh, in the Boston area and uh, there are five suspects and it's maddening to the cops because they don't know which one. They're all tied for first place and, the, and it's, a, it's a who done it and a why done it. And it's called Heat of the Moment, uh, which is the follow-up, the same characters, uh, the follow-up to uh, um, Rumor of Evil. Yeah. Okay, so you've sent that next one in. Yeah. I have to ask you, therefore, are you already working on another one or are you taking a hiatus no, this for is, a this couple of weeks? Or I'm, taking, <laughs> I'm crawling out of the bunker yeah. and taking a breather. <laughs> good, good for you. 
Well, Garrett, thank you for coming today. Oh, this is uh, this has been a pleasure to to have you back. And um, when you when your new book comes out, you can come back and tell us more about that. Absolutely. And um, how many more languages it's been translated <laughs> into, and if you're going to be doing book events in Europe and China and and, and wherever. But uh, until then. You know, good luck with your writing, and uh, we look forward to the, to the next venture. Great. Thank and, you, John. Uh, Thank you. you. You helped the town of Arlington, being a resident a resident artist, and um, you helped the world of literature. So, so that's a that's a terrific thing to Thank you. to have. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck to you, and um, see you in October. Great. Thank you.